This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. So you may have missed last week. On Friday, we talked about how Eric Estevio's Twitter lawsuit was dismissed. Um, the court had some problems with turning Twitter into a company town style situation. They are not a state actor, according to the judge. And then Eric Estevio voluntarily dismissed his case. At the same time, an attorney named Maria Rutenberg filed her own lawsuit against Twitter, basically alleging the same things, maybe phrased a little more eloquently, but still making all of the same mistakes, in my opinion, that Eric Estevio and many other of these kinds of lawsuits have made, alleging that Twitter is a state actor and Donald Trump's Twitter account is some kind of designated public forum. By designated public forum, I'm sure that she means that it is some kind of governmental f First Amendment free speech protected zone for expressing oneself in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's protected by the First Amendment. But instead of coming at it from the perspective that Donald Trump has some right to be on Twitter, she's saying that she has a right for Donald Trump to be on Twitter at least the tweets that were made during his presidential administration. So she filed this lawsuit, and then we covered the complaint in saying that Twitter is some kind of designated public forum and Donald Trump's account is protected by the First Amendment. It can only be protected by the First Amendment if Twitter or the account is some kind of state actor. She cited to Knight First Amendment Institute, which was a case that said that Donald Trump can't block people from viewing his Twitter account. But I made the argument that Knight First Amendment Institute does not stand for the principle that Twitter can't block Donald Trump from using their service. And I gave an example about maybe someone getting on their soapbox or taking advantage of a open mic night at your local pub or something doesn't mean that that's a designated public forum. You're allowed to host speech sometimes and deny speech other times when you are a private actor. And there's also the Masterpiece Cake case where the cake maker was allowed to deny services to a gay couple who wanted a wedding cake. And that was kind of under religious freedom grounds, but the idea that a private entity can deny service to just about anyone unless they are part of a protected class, which is usually race, sex, uh, origin, things like that, disability sometimes, uh, but not political viewpoint or not violations of terms of service. So if we assume for a moment that Donald Trump violated Twitter's terms of service, which is a decision that Twitter has a right to make for themselves, then Twitter can ban whoever they want for a violation of their terms of service. Maybe in some way there's other arguments that they couldn't say that, oh, well, if your skin color is darker, you can't be on Twitter. Maybe that's some kind of violation, but that's not what the decision was made for. And now Maria Rutenberg has doubled down. And whereas we started with a complaint Maria has now made a motion for a temporary restraining order, making all the same arguments. But the restraining order was scheduled for March 9th, and she feels that she's being damaged every single day, irreparably harmed by not being able to view Donald Trump's former Twitter account, or the former president's former Twitter account. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting... I'm getting all of my words mixed up. So then she files a motion, an ex parte motion, which means we're not even going to worry about the other party, even though they're available. Uh, but she makes an ex parte motion to shorten the length of time so that we can get a hearing even faster on this 
proposed temporary restraining order, a restraining order that, by the way, would require Twitter to enable Donald Trump's account so that Maria Rutenberg can view his tweets and comment on them and retweet and reply and all of that. And so they write a proposed order asking for a much earlier hearing date, February 9th at 2 p.m. And this was filed on January 28th. And then literally, this is the most amazing part, literally two hours later, the judge issues an order on that proposed motion to expedite and order and temporary restraining order, outright denying Maria Rutenberg her temporary restraining order. And this is what I wanted to share with you today because this order is amazing. It is an order, one, denying the motion for a temporary restraining order, and two, denying as moot the ex parte motion to shorten time. And the judge writes, Having reviewed the motion for temporary restraining order filed by plaintiff Maria Rutenberg, the motion for a temporary restraining order is denied. A fundamental flaw in Rutenberg's entire case is that the claimed rights under the First Amendment and the corollary claims under the 14th Amendment, uh, that's the incorporation to, of the states. So the First Amendment applies to the federal government. The 14th Amendment takes the Bill of Rights and applies it to the states. That case for claimed rights cannot be enforced against a private entity such as defendant Twitter. See Manhattan Community Access Corporation v. Halleck, a 2019 Supreme Court case saying, the text and original meaning of those amendments, as well as this court's longstanding precedents, established that the free speech clause prohibits only governmental abridgment of speech. The free speech clause does not prohibit private abridgment of speech. See Belgao v. Inslee, a Ninth Circuit 2020 case, saying the Supreme Court has long held that merely private conduct, however discriminatory or wrongful, falls outside the purview of the 14th Amendment. And see Roberts v. AT&T Mobility LLC, a Ninth Circuit 2017 case. A threshold requirement of any constitutional claim is the presence of state action, because the First Amendment right to petition is a guarantee only against abridgment by the government. State action is a necessary threshold, which a plaintiff must cross before we can even consider whether a defendant infringed upon a plaintiff's First Amendment rights. See Flag Brothers Inc. v. Brooks, a 1978 Supreme Court case. While as a factual matter any person with sufficient physical power may deprive a person of his property, only a state or a private person whose action may be fairly treated as that of a state itself may deprive him of an interest encompassed within the 14th Amendment's protection. The court continues, Further, Rutenberg failed to comply with the court's local rules and effectuate service, and accordingly, the motion is procedurally defective as well. Moreover, in light of the foregoing, Rutenberg's ex parte motion to shorten the briefing schedule is denied as moot. This order terminates docket numbers 9 and 10, which were the temporary restraining order. It is so ordered January 28th, 2021, Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers, United States District Judge for the Northern District of California. And this is the right result. There was never a world in which this would not be the result. There is so much precedent explaining that only state actors, which would be the government, the states, local municipalities, company towns like Marsh v. Alabama, those are all state actors. If a private company is hired to act on behalf of a state. Um, I'll give you a stupid but quick personal example. Pennsylvania recently started their own healthcare.gov style service called Penny, and it automatically signed me up for health insurance, even though I terminated my health insurance when I moved to Luxembourg, and I now have Luxembourg health insurance through their system. Penny signed me up for health insurance. That even though Penny might be some kind of private company working for the state, they are performing a state function. Therefore, they are a state actor. You have to ask yourself, is 
Twitter being hired by the government? Is Twitter working for the government? Is Twitter performing an action that is exclusively the function of a government? No, hosting speech on social media is not a government function. There is no right to have a Twitter account. There is no right to have a Facebook account. If Facebook or Twitter decides that there are other restrictions, only celebrities can have Twitter accounts. Only celebrities can have blue check marks. Those things are not rights that any one individual can claim. Sure, we could have legislation from the government creating the free speech website, whatever it is, we could call it something. We, we don't have one. So we could, we could make a law that creates a free speech website and everybody who wants to say stuff can go on there. And the, the, the line for legal versus illegal conduct will be the Brandenburg line, the incitement to lawless action, the incitement to imminent lawless action. You can go watch our video on the Brandenburg line, but that would be the difference. Twitter can have a different standard. Twitter can have a standard where they can deny their services basically at will. And this is consistent with what we know that private companies have control. What I often find interesting, I'm going to call it hypocrisy, but I don't mean it in like a mockery hypocrisy. I mean, it's literally hypocrisy to say that private entities should be able to be free of government control and then be calling on the government to tell Twitter that they have to host the president's speech. You can't have both. You could say that you can't eat your cake and have it too. So this is the right result. There's no world in which I see Maria Rutenberg's Twitter lawsuit or Eric Estevio's Twitter lawsuit or Prager University's Google lawsuit succeeding in forcing these private entities to host their content. It's one thing if you have a contractual agreement that says, under all these circumstances, we will host your content. It's another thing when you are the product, which is Let's be, let's be fair. That's what social media is about. They host your content as long as it benefits them. And the moment it stops benefiting them, then, you know, they have no use for you anymore and you're, you're gone. Or if you're violating their, their terms, which kind of is the same thing as, you know, not useful anymore. Now, now you're more of a problem than you are useful. I'm actually quite surprised that Twitter hosted certain kinds of speech as long as they did because they didn't have to. And there's no CDA 230 argument here or anything like that. Uh, CDA 230 actually makes it so that platforms can host more speech than what they would be able to host if they were without CDA 230. And even then, even without CDA 230, you still have vicarious liability standards. Uh, when is someone liable for the content on their platform? And generally speaking, the host is not liable until they have red flag knowledge of something illegal on their platform. And the CDA 230 says it's, it's then legal to remove offensive content. What does that mean? Twitter could always remove content that is offensive. I, I don't really understand how we get so twisted about CDA 230. But there you go. So the Rutenberg lawsuit is all but over. It, it's, it's already there. This is the beginning of the end. The judge has said that there is a fundamental flaw in Rutenberg's entire case. So unless Rutenberg can somehow overcome the fundamental flaw that the judge already knows and understands that Twitter is a private actor and that Rutenberg doesn't have any claim here, then it's just a matter of Twitter filing a very basic motion to dismiss and the judge granting the motion to dismiss. I assume if, if and when Twitter is served with this lawsuit, I think they've been served, uh, then they will have to respond within the next week or two 
they have 21 days is, is the typical amount of time and that can be adjusted with with motions for extensions of time or if they were served by waiver of service uh, you get 60 days instead so we'll see what happens there but I fully expect that this is the beginning of the end for the Maria Rutenberg case and, and it's surprising to me because these plaintiffs put a lot of time and effort into writing these cases they have to know that they are not going to overcome a plethora of precedent that says that they won't succeed so it all it often seems to me like these are just efforts in propaganda efforts in in uh, spreading or basically the plaintiff now gets to go and and pretend to be a martyr you know oh i tried to fight for the cause of free speech but the court denied me those corrupt courts and of course the court is not corrupt in any way this is the right result but 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 people who want to cry foul can create their own self-fulfilling prophecy you know they file a free speech law or they they file a lawsuit under the guise of free speech and then when it fails they go oh look help help i'm being oppressed it's a very self-fulfilling prophecy uh, uh, an act in hypocrisy an effort in madness i really don't understand how we we as a society can put up with this but i guess it's not truly we there's a terrible divide in our society right now and i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm really not sure why it's there i i live an evidence-based life i don't try to make the world conform to my beliefs i try to conform my beliefs to what is real in the world i particularly enjoy uh physics and philosophy and and science and technology i i don't enjoy things that require me to twist my critical thinking skills out of whack and make giant assumptions and giant conclusions without any basis in fact or in this case in law and i just that's what it's, it's a bit baffles me it's it's uh it just doesn't it doesn't compute so let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what you think the reason is for filing all of these clearly baseless lawsuits. Is it just propaganda? Is it a misunderstanding of law? Can can this be because she filed it through another lawyer? Can Maria and her lawyer both ser this seriously misunderstand the law, or did they really really think that they're gonna win this time? Yeah. So I'm confused. You tell me if you're confused too. Maybe, maybe we're not confused and it really is just an effort in propaganda or martyrdom. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplane, and on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern. Our channel is community supported by your monthly financial contributions on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsors.com slash law, through YouTube membership, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of January. Joe Tyson, Mitchell Roten, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Heitoff, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Becherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Hot Grills in Your Area, Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Cassandra Curran, Sovereign Titizen, Shadow Tycho, RDH Dragon, Earthbound Star, Nathan McCarty, and Awful Asses with Lemon Fresh. And thank you as well to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on your screen. I hope everyone has a great week. I will see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. Bye.